morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, very much for joining the Biosphere Reserves and Peace session hosted by the Republic of Korea. My name is Eun-Yang Kim from the Korean National Commission for UNESCO. I am very pleased to organize this event to highlight the role of Biosphere Reserves for Peace. Actually, we have already uh, addressed this issue in 2019. Uh, at the 31st session of NEP ICC. And now, today's session has been prepared for the commemorate the 50th anniversary of NEP program. First, I would like to open the session by inviting Mr. Chung Ho Gyeon, Director General for uh, Public Diplomacy and Cultural Affairs, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea, to give his opening remarks on behalf of, on behalf of the host. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to side event on Biosphere Reserve and Peace in celebration of 50th anniversary of MAP program. Since its establishment in 1971, the MAP program has achieved remarkable ac accomplishments. Biosphere Reserve have contributed significantly to sustainable development as well as harmonious coexistence of nature and humans. The issue of biosphere reserve and peace is of a great significance for, Co for Korea. At the 31st session of the MAP ICC in 2019, the border area near uh, DMZ was designated as Yeoncheon Imjin River and Gangwon Eco Peace Bios Spear are uh, reserved. To celebrate the meaningful designation, Korea held the first side event on Biosphere Reserves and Peace in 2019 to illuminate the role and potential of Biosphere Reserves contributing to peace. The subject of the program today cover the major issue, issues of the MAP program in a timely manner. Uh, throughout the workshop, we will look into peace between people and nature, uh, as well as people among neighboring countries through transboundary biosphere reserves. Furthermore, we will also address the biosphere reserves from the perspective of sustainable development and the use, which is a key factors in mission of U UNESCO. I hope today's event will help us to better understand the effects of biosphere reserved on promoting peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then let me hand the floor over to Dr. Dong Han, Secretary General of the Korean National Commission for UNESCO, for his welcome remarks. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all and thank all those who helped this event happen. As you celebrate the 50th anniversary of the UNESCO ABB program, the Republic of Korea wishes to highlight one of the most important, but less noticed roles of this program, namely the promotion of a peace. Peace, not only in the traditional sense, but also in the sense of the, the ability of humans to exist sustainably with the rest of the natural world. Such a peace is a prerequisite, not just for a harmonious future, but for our very survival. With 714 sites in 129 countries, UNESCO Biosphere Reserves offer abundant opportunities for cooperation to promote peace in a variety of ways. Rather than keeping nature separate from human activities, they seek the harmonious coexistence and integration of people and nature therefore leading to peace between them. By offering humans opportunities to experience and connect with the beauty of biodiversity in nature, they also bring benefits to our spirits, promoting peace within human minds. Furthermore, transboundary biosphere reservoirs act as a site of international collaboration that encourage neighboring countries not simply to achieve a more effective regional conservation of biodiversity, but in working together 
to understand each other better, so encouraging regional peace. I'm extremely grateful to all the speakers at this event today, who each bring unique experiences and knowledge of promoting peace in UNESCO Biosphere Reservoirs. I would also like to thank everyone who has made the time to attend this event. I hope you will find it both informative and thought-provoking, and I look forward to very fruitful discussions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Now, let me invite Noeli, Director AI of the Division of Ecological and Earth Sciences, and Sciences to deliver a presentation covering the role of biosphere reserves in promoting peace and sustainable development. Please give her a warm welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's a honor and a pleasure for me to deliver an opening speech at the side event of the 33rd session of the International Coordinating Council of the MAP program, and also in the context of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the MAP program. As this year continues to be impacted by the COVID-19 pandemics, the Council hosted by Nigeria is held in an hybrid mode, including the side event on bus reserves and peace. This side event is dedicated to the role of bus reserve in promoting peace, which is a core mission of UNESCO. This side event is a follow up on the previous side event held in Paris in June 2019 on the same topic. And uh, this side event in 2019 was held to celebrate the designation of the Gangwa Eco Peace and Yonchan Imjin River Bass Reserve. I want also to recall one very touching moment we had during the 30th MAP ICC meeting in Palembang when the council designated sites from Republic of Korea and from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And during this moment, the two delegation congratulated each other. And it was a very touching moment because we could see how the MAP program link people and really promote cooperation. For the last 50 years celebrating my, my UNESCO MAP program, the Bath Reserve has been places to promote harmonious coexistence among people and nature, but also learning places for sustainable development through biodiversity conservation and sustainable use of natural resources. Furthermore, Transboundary Bass Reserve, which are jointly proposed by two or more member states, collaborate and foster cooperation between neighboring countries. Let me emphasize the role of Transboundary Bass Reserve. As you may know, yesterday the Council approved two more transboundary bass reserves in the World Network of Bass Reserves. The first one, the Murad Rava Danube Tab Tab Transboundary Bass Reserve, sorry, is the first one that has been submitted by five countries, Austria, Croatia, Hungary, Serbia, and Slovenia. The second one, the Oofs Lake Depression Transboundary Bass Reserve is connecting Mongolia and the Russian Federation, and it is the second transboundary in the Eurasia region. As of today, the World Network of Bass Reserve counts 22 transboundary bass reserve, and the first one were designated in 1992, where we had one designated between Czech Republic and Poland, and the second one between Poland and Slovakia. Yesterday, also some of us were able to follow the said event on the biosphere and heritage 
of Lake Chad project. This project is aimed to implement the approach of bus reserve around the Lake Chad area. This project is implemented in Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Niger, and Nigeria. And it was officially launched here in Abuja in February 2018. And this program, this project serves as a successful example of scientific, cultural, and socioeconomic cooperation involving 10,000 of people. Cooperative activities related to bus reserves are therefore particularly important for border regions, where there are often communities with strong cultural and ethnic ties and unique ecosystems with great biodiversity that cannot be separated by political. With high biodiversity, straddle national land borders. Apart from the benefit for biodiversity conservation, transboundary protected areas can also play a significant role in fostering greater cooperation and understanding among countries. In many parts of the world, transboundary protected areas have been instrumental in building bridges between nations and peoples. Innovative approaches in transboundary cooperation could therefore offer an opportunity to pursue peace and reconciliation in certain cases. I'm very much convinced that the 22 UNESCO transboundary bus reserve provide an obvious source of highly valuable cooperative models for preserving ecosystems as well as promoting peace. Ending my opening remark, I would like to express my high gratitude to the current National Commission for UNESCO for the MAP National Committee of the Republic of Korea and for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Environment of the Republic of Korea for organizing this very important side event. I am very grateful to you to organize this today in the framework of the 50th anniversary of the MAP program. And it's important that we have it today because it will lead us to the path of the more the 14, 50 years, um, years before us to build peace through the MAP program while promoting and sharing activities in Bass Reserve. I'm convinced that Bass Reserve and the MAP program are tools for peace building. And I look forward to very fruitful discussions today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to invite Professor Do Sun Jo, Chair of MAP National Committee of the Republic of Korea, to chair the following presentations. Professor Jo had been working as a member of the International Advisory Committee for Biosphere Reserves for the past eight years and has greatly contributed to promoting MAP activities in the Republic of Korea. Please give him a warm welcome. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you all for joining us in this side event on Biosphere Reserves and Peace. Today, we will have four presentations regarding peace in the biosphere reserves with these different aspects. Now, I would like to ask Professor Chorin Yu at the Jeju National University in the Republic of Korea to deliver a presentation entitled Peace Between People and Nature in Biosphere Reserves. Please give him a warm welcome. I talk about the peace between people and nature by presenting the culture of the Jehenia, even diverse in Jeju Island Biosphere Reserve. Jeju Island is located off the southernmost point of the Korean Peninsula. Jeju Island Biosphere Reserve 
was designated in 2002 and expanded to the whole island, including its marine areas in 2019. My presentation is based on three key points. Peace and sustainable development are two sides of the same coin. Sustainable development is based on good governance. Good governance refers to a vehicle through its consensus and peace are both an end and a means. Biosphere reserves encourage the efforts to integrate biodiversity and cultural diversity, emphasize the importance of traditional knowledge in managing ecosystems. Peace, including freedom from conflict, discrimination, and violence in all forms, is a prerequisite for sustainable development. Ecological peace depends on fair access and control to natural resources by local people without any form of discrimination or exclusion. Peace requires appropriate systems of conflict prevention and resolution. Local social practice is a dialogue, conflict resolution and reconciliation play an important role worldwide. Such practices enable people to live together peacefully and regulate access to shared natural resources. In addition to Jeju Island Biosphere Reserve, a part of Jeju Island was designated as a World Heritage Site with the name of Jeju Volcanic Island and the Lava Tubes in 2007. Jeju Island UNESCO Global Geopark that was designated in 2010 includes 13 geosites. There are also five Ramsar sites in Jeju Island since 2006. Two elements of Jeju culture were inscribed on the representative list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Culture of Jeju Henya Women Divers in 2016, and Jeju Chilmari Tang Yongdungkut Shamanist Ritual in 2009. In 2005, the Korean government designated Jeju Island as the island of world peace based on ecological peace and peace of tolerance. Jeju Island is supposed to establish ecological peace to conserve ecosystem through the healing power of nature. It is also supposed that peace of tolerance might come from the openness of the island. And there are women divers who dive for seafood without using any breathing approaches. An average henna holds her breath for up to a minute while diving up to 10 meters underwater to get marine products, including top shells, sea urchins, agar, sea cucumbers, abalone, etc. A henna works for four to six hours a day and about 90 days a year. With the expansion of Jeju Island Biosphere Reserve in 2019, all the areas where Hena Dive were included in the reserve transition areas. The sustainability of eco-friendly diving work is a very important characteristic of Hena culture and at the core of a peace between people and nature. The human greed for a big catch is counterbalanced by an individual's limited capacity to remain underwater without the aid of breathing equipment. 
each village fishery cooperative, which has exclusive fishing rights over the sea near its village, decides the number of days for diving each year under the law, regulates working hours per day and the size of the catch, and prohibits the use of some technologies to avoid excessive fishing. This photo taken in 2006 shows that the head of a village fishery cooperative waves a flag in order to stop the diving work. Nowadays, the siren is used instead of a flag. Henya Association, affiliated with the Village Fishery Cooperative, is a voluntary organization of Henya. The Henya Association has implemented several measures to dive sustainably in its sea. For example, sowing the seeds of top shells and abalone in deep sea is one of the duties of the Jeju Henya. Since Henya considered the underwater area as a sea farm, as shown in the portal, they jointly cleaned the seashore and the intertidal zone and removed unwanted seaweed several times a year to promote better growth of desirable marine products. The traditional ecological knowledge of the Jeju Henya is a very good example of the integration of biodiversity and cultural diversity. The Jeju Henya has her own mental map of the sea, including the location of reefs and habitat for shellfish. Local knowledge of the topography of the reefs is an important fact in helping the Henya know where to go to catch seafood successfully. Through long experience for diving, they can est estimate where the abalone may be lasting today. The Henya also have local knowledge of the winds and the tide. When they decide where to work and when, they consider the direction of the wind and the sea current and the current conditions of the tide. Such ecological knowledge is acquired through repeated diving experience by each henya. In the culture of Jeju henya, there are customary norms to prevent and resolve conflicts peacefully within the henya community. According to their diving skills, Jeju henya are classified in three groups. Higher skilled, middle skilled, and lower skilled divers. The ranking of the Henya community is closely related to the fact that the Henya profession requires years of practice. Most Jeju Henya rely upon higher skilled Henya's weather forecast for diving rather than listening to the official forecast. However, at the meeting of the Henya Association, each individual Henya has a right to speak and has the opportunity to express her opinion freely. The Henya are competitors in gathering modern products, but also trusting companions in their dangerous work in the sea. During a dive, they make sure that they work in groups to monitor the safety of the other nearby henya. Since cooperation is the essence of diving work, the Henya Association decides unanimously. However, when opinions of three groups are too different to reach an agreement, the opinion of the higher skilled group is respected. And 
Every member should absolutely agree with the conclusion of the president of the Henya Association. Jeju Henya have a deep sense of respect among them. For example, two allowed the less fit senior Henya have some catch, relatively safe and less deep parts of the sea are often designated as the C4 grannies, where only the elderly Henya can die. In the past, it was expected that most young girls in the coastal villages would learn the diving skills in the shallow patch of the pregnancy called the sea for babies. Obviously, hijiki, a kind of brown seaweed, is an example of fair access to natural resources. Hijiki grows everywhere on the local marine lakes and it is jointly gathered, dried, and sold by the members of each village fishery cooperative, including the Henya. One person from each family that joined the cooperative, regardless of gender, is mobilized to gather hijiki. An income from each sale is shared equally. Some villages use a certain portion of the income for village management, promoting social cohesion and cultural continuity for the village. The sea is divided into several zones for administration of the hijiki harvest. The income from the harvest depends on how well hijiki grows in each zone. In the case of Kapado Island, the sea is divided into 10 zones for harvesting hijiki. And every year, the zone for each group is changed in an effort to use resources fairly. In such ways, the Deju Henya have peacefully resolved conflicts that each individual's greed can trigger within the Henya community. Their eco-friendly method of collecting seafood limited by the ability to hold their breath underwater is an example of harmonious relations between humans and nature. The ecological peace created by the culture of the Henya shows how biosphere reserves in contributing to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity can also contribute to peace. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Yu. It's very interesting to see how the culture of women divers living in Jeju Island Biosphere Reserve contributes to the eco piece of the whole region. Our next speaker will be Mr. Torsten Rapp, who is the head of the Hessian Administrative Office of the Rhone Biosphere Reserve in Germany. He is going to be talking about how peace is promoted among the neighboring countries through transboundary biosphere reserves by showing the case of Rhone Biosphere Reserve in Germany. Mr. Thorsten Rapp, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Thorsten Rapp. It is a pleasure for me to give you the presentation about the Biosphere Reserves and Peace from the Biosphere Reserve Rain with peace among neighboring countries through transboundary biosphere reserves. Here we go. My name is Thorsten Raab and I'm born 1969 in Fulda during the Cold War. Short some things about my family. Normally I don't tell you about my family, but I think it's interesting in this case 
My father is born in Fulda in Hessen and my mother is born in Fara at the end of the Second World War. So I have relatives also in Hessen and also in Thuringia. Now I'm head of the Hessian Administrative Office of the Marine Biosphere Reserve since the year 2011. First, some information about our UNESCO Biosphere Reserve Rhone. It's a low mountain range over three federal states. Federal states are Bavaria, Hessen, and Thuringia, and six districts, two of them in Bavaria, two in Hessen, and two in Thuringia. The area is about 243,000 hectares total, and in Bavaria, nearly the half, about 129,000 hectares, in Hessen, 64,000 hectares, and in Thuringia, 48,000 hectares, with about 220,000 inhabitants. We have nearly 40% forest, and the rest are villages and meadows. We also have three biosphere reserve admin administrative offices, one in every federal state. We also have international partnerships from the biosphere, one with the biosphere reserve Kruger to Canyons in South Africa, and a very new one, biosphere reserve with BORE in Peru. On the map, you can see uh, the biosphere reserve ruin. Um, in the west, there's Hessen. In the east, northeast, you can see Thuringia, and in the south, there is Bavaria. And on the small map, small map, you can see all German biosphere reserves. And in the middle, there is the biosphere reserve room. A great turning point in history was the building of the Iron Curtain in the Rhine between Thuringia on the one side and Bavaria and Hess on the other side. It started with some small signs at the street you can see on the left picture. The beginning of the building a border after the Second World War between East and West Germany was in the 1950s, 60s of the last century. Later, the border became more and more fortified and there was no chance to cross the border. And people had to learn to live with this border for many, many years. Roads ended here and tourists came to see this border of the end, at the end of Germany. The picture on the right side is from um, a postcard. So uh, it was interesting for people to come here. But the people who lived here, it, wasn't, it was no attraction because they had no neighbors and families were divided here for decades. During the Cold War, the, uh, the OP point, point Alpha and Fulda Gap became part of the history here in the Rhone and in Germany. On the left picture, you can see two towers at the border. These military observation posts from the US forces and the GDR troops have been in direct contact at Point Alpha in the Rhone. It was not possible and life-threatening to cross the border here. The so-called Fulda Gap was one of the hottest places in the Cold War. If war broke out, hundreds of atomic mines and tactical nuclear weapons would have come to use here in the rain. Most people in the rain didn't know that during the Cold War, and I didn't know either. Then came a very special moment in history, the fall of the wall and the Iron Curtain in 1989. In November 1989, people in GDR took to the streets for freedoms, for very personal, individual and social freedom. And they were successful also at the border in the Rhone. There were special moments for me too, as a student, to drive with my friends to the border and visit my relatives in Thuringia the first time. 
I still remember it very, very well. A new time began for all of us. And thousands of people came to the border in the autumn of 1989 to meet their brothers and sisters on the other side of the Iron Curtain and to feel and enjoy freedom. Directly after the fall of the Iron Curtain, a new idea was born. A handful of people started to create a transboundary UNESCO Biosphere Reserve Ruin in Bavaria, Hesse, and Thuringia. In 1999, in 1990, first meeting of nature conservations from Hesse and Thuringia started to plan a cooperation for a new biosphere reserve in the Rhine. Some of these guys you can see on the left picture are still working together with us. And one of them in the middle was my colleague in Thuringia for many years. On the right side, you can see Dr. Klaus Töpfer in 1991 as the federal environment minister, later he was UNEP director, brings the UNESCO certificate personally to Karl Friedrich Abe, my colleague from Thuringia. He was head of the Thuringian administrative. You can see him on the right side. One important thing was to prevent the demolition of the OP point alpha and make it to a memorial and meeting place called Point Alpha in the early 90s. On the left side, a new house on the border was built and a chosen exhibition about the history of Point Alpha, the Iron Curtain, the life behind the border, and also the green belt in the Biosphere Reserve. Many contemporary witnesses tell their personal stories here. The US camp today on the right side shows the work and the life of soldiers during the Cold War. The Point Alpha Foundation and also the Point Alpha Award was got uh, Gorbachev, Bush Senior, Helmut Kohl and Lech Walesa are important institutions to remember the border and the Cold War and the value of peace and freedom. But there was more than war and weapons. No man's land along the former border became the green belt with lots of rare species, birds and plants. Nature was able to grow here undisturbed for decades. The green belt in Germany between east and west is about 1,400 kilometers long, 130 kilometers here in the Biosphere Reserve room. And parts of it are actually a national nature monument. And also the European Green Belt from the north of Norway to the Black Sea at Turkey, about 1,200 and 400 kilometers, goes about 24 states here in Europe. And also along the border, there was built the Path of Hope. It shows 14 monumental sculptures, and is linked to the Christian way of the cross. This border separated Germany, divided Europe and the world. Now it is part of a hiking trail across the border and the green belt, and it is a symbol for resistance. Resistance. Sorry. There have been three decades now to make the road a model region for sustainable development in the heart of Germany and Europe. Many initiatives started their work here in the Biosphere Reserve Room, and many people work together here in Hessen, Bavaria, and Thuringia. There are no borders at work, there are no borders in their head. For example, the Dach Market Ruin is a network and cooperation of 300 farmers producers and restaurants, and also the Rhone Apple Initiative with more than 3,000 organic apple farmers they produce is, for example, apple beer and apple sherry. Many projects in nature conservation about the red and black moor, the black grouse, the red kite, and also 
the small little world spring snail. And in sustainable tourism, we talk about hiking, biking, climbing, gliding and paragliding. And more and more people come here to the Rhone to use this as a tourist hotspot. Also now in the pandemic, many people enjoy the nature and all the other things in the Rhone, like organic food. Finally, three more examples for our work here in the Biosphere Reserve Rhone. It is often called the land of open spaces or the land of open distances. You can see it on the picture. Here it was possible to start many successful projects in our transboundary road network. One of these, one of them is the premium hiking trail called the Hochröner. It's from the south of the Bavarian Rhone to the north of the Thuringian Rhone, over 175 kilometers, and it connects all parts of the region. Another, another project is the Sternenpark Rhone. It's an international dark sky reserve to protect the natural dark skies of the Rhone against light pollution. You can see it on the left picture. We started in 2014, and it is very, very successful and famous. And of course, the Rhone sheep, the Rhone schaf. We saved the Rhone sheep in the 90s and make it a tourist attraction and a symbol for sustainable development. The next days, we start our weeks of Rhone sheep gourmets. And I would like to invite you all. At the end, a picture of people from three countries of the Rhone who worked together over four years to write a new management plan for the next 15 years. We hope to continue the successful story of the Biosphere Reserve Room. We are working here together in three countries and in a global network. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Ra. I remember visiting Rand Biosphere Reserve 10 years ago, and I am still deeply thankful for the hospitality you have provided us. Congratulations on REN Biosphere Reserve's 30 years of peace. Now, I would like to ask Mr. Richard Ofori Amanfo, Regional Manager at Wildlife Division of Forestry Commission in Ghana, to deliver a presentation on Biosphere Reserves, a learning place for peace and sustainable development. Uh, Mr. Ofori Amanfo has been a manager at Bia Biosphere Reserve for 14 years and has been fully involved in the Green Economy Project funded by COICA through UNESCO. Please give him a warm welcome. I'm presenting on Bia Biosphere Reserve in Ghana, in this 33rd session of MAB ICC 2021. Uh, my name is uh, Mr. Richard Ufuri Amanfu. The presentation topic is on Baisha Reserve, a learning place for peace and sustainable development. A case study in the Bia Baisha Reserve. Ghana using the green economy in biosphere reserve project and transboundary project between Ghana and Abricus. These, these are maps showing the location of Bia Biosphere Reserve in Africa and Ghana as well. Introduction of Bia Biosphere Reserve. Bia Biosphere Reserve is in Ghana found in West Africa. In Western North region, situated at Bia West and Joaboso districts. The core of Bia Bashir Reserve was first gazetted as a national park in 1974. The core covers an area of 
306 kilometers square. The core is now a twin park, a national park and a resource reserve forming a conservation area. The Abashia Reserve became the first Abashia Reserve in Ghana, approved in 1982. Some other areas were added to the Bia Conservation Area, forming the Bia Baishia Reserve. Now, the total area of Bia Baishia Reserve is 1,143 square kilometers. The area is transitional zone between moist evergreen and semi evergreen forests. The core area is less disturbed, rich with forest trees and wild animals including elephants, bongo, six primates, darkest, and others. The core area and buffer zone are, are fully managed by Wildlife Division of Forestry Commission in Ghana. Some community resource management areas, uh, known as streamers, have been formed in the Bia Biosphere Reserve to support wildlife conservation, to support wildlife conserve the transition area, a map showing the Abashia Reserve. Some pictures of core area of the uh, Abashia Reserve and buffer zones, some animals. Conflicts resulting in the use of natural resources in the Abashia Reserve. The population in the Abashia Reserve is over 380,000. The population live depends largely on the natural resource in the biosphere reserve, particularly in the core areas. Moreover, some people staying outside the biosphere reserve livelihoods also depend on the biosphere reserve. The management of the biosphere, the biosphere reserve is making all efforts to ensure sustainable management of the natural resources, particularly in the core areas. These bring conflicts and sometimes clashes between the biosphere reserve staff and the communities. Clashes have sometimes resulted in serious injuries and even death among communities and the biosphere reserve staff. In 2019, one staff was shot dead by a poacher. Introduction of alternative livelihood support projects in the biosphere reserve to enhance peace and collaboration from conservation. BRAF project was introduced in 1997. Community forest-based project has also been uh, in existence in 2006 to 2009, providing some minor livelihood support. Protected Area Development Program, that is PADP2 by European Union was also in and introduced some minor livelihood support. The Green Economy in Biosphere Reserve Project from 2013 to 2017. This has huge livelihood impact on the Biosphere Reserve. The Green Economy in Biosphere Reserves Project. The Green Economy in Biosphere Reserve is a means to biodiversity conservation, poverty reduction, and sustainable development. Ultimate goal is to improve livelihood of local communities, socioeconomic status, while conserving biodiversity. The Green Economy Biosphere Reserve Project was funded by the Korean International Cooperation Agency, COICA, through UNESCO and implemented by EPE, including Ghana MAP Committee and Wildlife Division, via Biosphere Reserve. The project started from September 2013 to April 2017. The Green Economy Project Wood activities implemented in the Abyssphere Reserve, the training undertaking. Uh, Since the three people were trained in agriculture, beekeeping, 77 people were trained in palm oil extraction, 62 people were trained in snail farming, and 29 people were trained in mushroom production, making a total of 231. Beneficiaries from 29 communities were trained as trainers to train other community members in the community. They were equipped and supplied with materials. The Green Economy Project 
was very successful. Additionally, people joined the groups after the project, especially the palm oil extraction and beekeeping groups. These are some features showing the beekeeping training and snail farming. These are some pictures showing the snail farming in the biosphere reserve and mushroom production. Some pictures showing some mushroom production in biosphere reserve and training of the use of palm oil extraction machines. General benefits of green economy, green economy in biosphere reserve to local communities for sustainable development. The beneficiaries acquired additional skills through the livelihood training programs, improve the livelihood of the local communities, educating their children in tertiary institutions. Cooperatives were formed to improve marketing opportunities and advertise their product. Exposed to other improved farming methods through the mushroom production training, opening of bank accounts, access to savings and loans to improve upon their livelihood. Peace and collaboration envisaged in the Bia Biosphere Reserve resulting from the Green Economy Group in Biosphere Reserve project. The community's bio livelihood is improving, thereby reducing conflicts between Bia Biosphere Reserve staff and local communities in natural resource use. As the local communities have some of the natural resources readily at their disposal, unsustainable harvests of the natural resources are re declining, reducing clashes. Security information to Bia Biosphere Reserve authorities enhanced, reducing dangerous poachers in the Bia Biosphere Reserve, pro promoting sustainable conservation and peace. Poachers sometimes come to the communities and as a result, trying to arrest them cause a lot of uh, crashes. But with security information that people come into us, now we are working together, bringing peace. The community members comply with the laid down regulation, enhancing good collaboration between biosphere reserve staff and community members. Beneficiaries feel embarrassed when arrested for involvement in poaching, so they try to avoid illegalities, bringing peace in the biosphere reserve. The Bia Biosphere Reserve project is enhancing good relationship among various communities. Communities see that supporting conservation could improve livelihood, and there is the need for collaboration. The Abyssinian Reserve staff are now closer to community members, bringing good relationship, conservation, education, and peace in the Abyssinian Reserve. There, there was also a transboundary project between the Abyssinian Reserve, Ghana, and Agassan Forest Reserve in Africa in 2015 and 2018. This is called Bia Diam Barakro Transfrontier Conservation Area, funded by FAO, GEF, and implemented mainly by Conservation Alliance, supported by Wildlife Division. The objective is to establish viable and sustainable transfrontier conservation area that links forest reserves and protected areas in the two countries. These are maps showing the transboundary project. Peace and cooperation envisaged in Ghana and Ivory Coast due to the transboundary project. Improve high level international collaboration between Ghana and Ivory Coast through interministerial and Nigeria meetings. Undisturbed international boundary patrols by monitoring of elephants and other species. International local communities exchange visits and interactions, bringing good cooperation and peace among the two countries. Learn from each other conservation methods and cooperation in transfer of knowledge and bringing good collaboration and sustainable conservation between the two countries. In conclusion, implementation of livelihood activities in the communities with, within Biosphere Reserve could foster good relationship, peace, and sustainable development. This must be pursued. International co collaboration in natural resource man management is a means of cooperation, respect, to each of that country, peace and enhancement of sustainable conservation and, and development. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Ofori Amamfo. It was indeed interesting to see how GEBR project has contributed to the local communities in Ghana for the promotion of sustainable development and peace. Last but not least, we have a very special presentation 
by a young scientist, Ms. Hiliatus Zakia. Uh, she is a climate reality leader at Climate Reality Project Indonesia and uh, also a PhD student at George Mason University. She worked at the Office of the President's Special Envoy for Climate Change 2015 to 2019 in Indonesia and has been actively speaking about low carbon development and climate resilient future around the world. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Zakia for a presentation on peace imagined by use in biosphere reserve. Okay. Hi everyone, um, I'm Leah Zakia. I'm from Indonesia, uh, but I'm currently in the US right now doing a PhD in climate change communication. Um, before doing this PhD, I was working for Indonesian government, um, which is the office of the president's special envoy for climate change. And my main task at that time was uh, in the, uh, um, the policies and, and then also in the outreach, especially to young people. So in related to that work, probably that's why I'm invited to be uh, um, one of the speakers here. And it's my great honor uh, to be here uh, with all of you. And then I will be really happy to share some of the work that we have done. Um, and then also our uh, youth alumni from our programs that can kind of provide some perspective on how peace and bias for research uh, can be connected. So yeah, this is me. Uh, and since 2015, I've been organizing this uh, a camp um, targeting Indonesian youth. It's called uh, Youth Leadership Camp on Climate Change, or we call it now Climate Crisis or YLCCC. So since then, we have uh, 2000 alumni, um, you know, across Indonesia and UNESCO Office Jakarta has actually supported a great supporter of our um, activities in 2017 UNESCO and then also UNITAR and other partners supported the organization of three youth camps um, in Indonesia, which is first in Chibodas Biosphere Reserve. Uh, you can see the picture here, um, also here with all the mentors and the trainers as well and representative from UNESCO. Uh, and then also in Bukit Barisan uh, Selatan National Park, um, which, you know, we visited the national park there and having a, a day journey over there, learning about the biodiversity uh, in the national park. And then uh, the last one in 2017 that was, that was supported by UNESCO was in Leuser National Park, uh, where we, you know, spent time there uh, having the training and see here, like you can see participants, can see orang utan, can you spot orang utan over there? Uh, we were so happy uh, to see that uh, in, you know, their natural habitat, this is their home. So, and, and then um, last year, just before the pandemic, uh, UNESCO of Jakarta also uh, supported the another YLCCC in uh, Banyuwangi in Java, Baluna National Park. And then here, um, at that time, they were learning about, you know, the basic science of climate change um, and then also how to communicate it to their peers when they go back to their communities. So YLCCC um, or any activities that can, you know, provide our youth to convene, to network, to learn, to express, to explore, to reimagine their future uh, is really important to build the future of our society. Because when they understand more about um, the ecosystem, sometimes that far away from where they are, um, they can build the sense of, you know, um, a belonging to that. 
And I would like to um, highlight some of our alumni. One is Sara Siahaan. She was also sent by UNESCO Office Jakarta as one of uh, the three delegates from Indonesia youth to join the tribal climate camp that was uh, organized in uh, Seattle, USA in 2017, or 2018, sorry. Um, so she was there uh, learning, meeting with other um, ethnicities groups in the US, understanding that you know each of these ethnicities have languages that are so connected to their environment. Uh, to their nature, to their ecosystems, which is kind of the same what, uh, which with uh, what she has in her own country. So it's actually all these people, uh, uh, different ethnicities across the world, like we're like thousand miles away, uh, actually have connection in terms of you know the language that they use that are related to the motherland. The second one is uh, Arum Arum Harahap. Um, she, he was also uh, alumni from the Lucer National Park, and then he is currently an, an activist and also uh, just finished, well, no, still conducting his PhD in forest conservation. And Arum is from Tapanuli, and he was working uh, in Batang Toru um, uh, area where they have, uh, you know, Orang Utan Tapanuli. And he was sent by UNESCO of Jakarta again to speak at the um, New York Climate Summit in 2019. Um, and he met with you know, many other uh, activists and conservationists from other countries, such as you know, in the uh, tropical rainforest areas, such as from Amazon in Brazil, uh, from Congo. And then he learned there um, that the other uh, youth in their ecosystem also facing kind of uh, the same issues. And then he was feeling that I'm not alone because I know that some other youth in other parts of the country, they're also facing the same. And then they also have different uh, innovations of how to tackle those challenges. And then so he learned from that, not only that he also share what he has uh, been through, uh, in, in his work on that. And then he also mentioned about the importance of not only biodiversity, but also the cultural sustainability, because Arum has been working with indigenous community uh, in Sumatra, in Batang Toru area, uh, where he uh, met regularly uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the ecosystem and we also um, communities that live there. Uh, he's, he spoke to, and uh, speaking until now, uh, with many of them. And then they are all, um, you know, uh, providing great insights for Arum that actually these people are really connected to their nature. Um, that, you know, all their, their culture, uh, daily culture, or art forms such as songs, paintings are all related to the land where they belong. So Arum was um, uh, saying the importance of, you know, this is what he say, healthy and functioning ecosystem is crucial to ensure cultural sustainability of our indigenous communities and the future of youth and children. Because without them, if like the ecosystem is being damaged, uh, it'll, if it's gone, the sense of identity of these communities are gone. Not only these communities, but also a bigger societies as well, because their life, their culture is so related to that. And so, um, and he mentioned that, you know, I don't want later, like our youth um, um, saying something like, uh, why do uh, this animal or uh, these plants only exist in our paintings or songs? Where are they now? You know, so uh, that is like the idea of Arum that with the bias uh, fair reserve, we can make this uh, space that enable the sustainability of our culture, of the indigenous communities, especially that they can continue on uh, their life. And so to conclude uh, this, you know, with the argument that um, youth really um, 
have the capabilities and they need to be in the forefront of this their voices need to be heard uh in you know in the discussion of creating this safe space um for cultural learning and exploration to imagine and create their future to foster deep connection with nature to collaborate with others because you know that's where they meet with each other and then to excel because you know this bias for research through this program for example and the national parks could act as the breeding uh, ground uh, for these youth leaders they meet they learn they act and um, their action can be you know powerful to make changes in their own communities so we need more youth to be heard and to be involved in the creation and the development of these spaces the bias for reserve for example so uh, including more youth to be on board on you know what do they need uh, what is their imagination for these spaces to be and how they can be involved more in the management of these. Um, I think that would be crucial. I think that's the step that we need to take more seriously. And because it's not only that they can save their life from the worsening impacts of climate change and the environmental uh, degradation, but also uh, so that they can thrive. So it's not only about surviving, but we need them to thriving. So um, I think that's uh, the end of uh, my talk here. Uh, thank you, terima kasih. Thank you in Indonesia. And if you contact, uh, if you wanted to contact me, you can reach me through email or my social media. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lia Chakia. It was uh, an excellent presentation. And I was uh, impressed uh, by the active role of the young people in training and uh, conservation of the nature. We believe that uh, young people are actually the future of the MAP program. Thank you again, Lia. Uh, up to now, we have uh, listened uh, presentations uh, by speakers from four different countries and biosphere reserves. Uh, in 2015, uh, we know that the United Nations uh, set up 17 sustainable developmental goals, which were intended to be achieved by 2030. Among the 17 sustainable developmental goals, uh, we know that uh, biosphere reserves will be very useful in achieving the uh, SDG number 15 and uh, uh, 14, which are uh, conservation of biodiversity and the ecosystems in aquatic and uh, terrestrial areas. Uh, I also believe that the biosphere reserves will be very useful in fulfilling the SDG number 16, which means uh, peace and justice. Uh, okay. But the uh, meaning of peace is not that easy. We usually think that peace means uh, absence of war or uh, violence, but uh, we have to uh, add uh, uh, equal access to justice and uh, uh, protection of uh, fundamental free freedoms uh, in the concept of this. So we have to keep in mind that uh, the concept of peace is very complicated. Now I would like to open the floor uh, to take questions and uh, uh, comments uh, to the speakers. So if uh, uh, you have any questions, comments, please uh, leave them uh, in the Q&A window at the bottom of the screen, and together with your name, uh, the country of your origin, and uh, to whom your questions or comments are directed. Uh, 
uh, while waiting for the questions and the comments, I would like to ask uh, a question by myself. Uh, this question will be directed to uh, Mr. Torsten Rapp uh, from Germany. Uh, I think we have some similarities because uh, after the Second World War, uh, Korea was divided into North and South, and Germany was divided into East and West. Between uh, the two countries, uh, there are buffer zones. In Korea, the buffer zone is called uh, DMZ or demilitarized zone, and the width of the Korean DMZ is four kilometers. But in Germany, uh, the buffer zone is uh, uh, called Greenbelt or Green Espant. It's quite long, but the width is kind of small, a few hundred meters. So uh, I think that uh, uh, very thin ecological corridor will have some difficulties uh, in the conservation of biological diversity. So my question is, um, uh, do you have uh, any plan to uh, widen the width of the uh, German green expand in Rand Biosphere Reserve in the future, or strengthen the function of uh, uh, conservation in the buffer zone? Uh, Mr. Torsten Rapp, please. Thank you, Mr. Cho, for the question. Um, it's an interesting question for me, too. Um, I don't know the situation in Korea at the moment, um, but I think it's very interesting to see what happened here in Germany. It's like you uh, told us a small line, the green belt. Yeah, it's some of 100 meters sometimes. And it's for us, it's um, the, the former death strip where normally no trees, no forests have uh, been. So uh, it was a zone to, to see and uh, maybe to shoot uh, people uh, during the Cold War. It was an open land, it was grasslands, meadows, and there was uh, also some interesting species living there, birds and uh, some interesting flowers. And um, some of these parts are still open. And I think they have a high biodiversity we have to protect now. And these areas are not really a core zone for us. We have the core zones on the line at the at, on both sides of the of the uh, former border. So the the green belt is for us also uh, a possibility to be a string of beads to to bring a mix of uh, core zones and of buffer zones. So. We, we talk about the uh, former death strip as a small line, but we put core zones and other buffer zones with bigger areas together to mix it as a, as a good uh, combination of buffer and core zones. But we also uh, hear what the people are saying because the people uh, know this border for many, many years and they are happy and we are happy to that the, uh, that the Iron Curtain is history now. So also some people say, we don't want to have a green border now, a green border for more than kilometers or more than one kilometers, because the people have to cross this border. They want to cross the old border and they want to cross the new border, also the green belt. So I think we have to connect the nature with the people and make it possible to go through the green belt also. So uh, for us, it's, uh, it's, it's a kind of backbone. So we put things at the backbone with high nature quality, with bio, biodiversity, and the green belt is really a, a strong line for us now. And in Thuringia, it's a national nature monument at the moment. And in Hessen, we talk about the, the same function, but in a, another dimension. Um, and we just looking which parts of uh, our nature in Hessen is uh, maybe the, the, the new part of the green belt. So we are still in discussion 30 years after falling down the wall. So uh, it's, it's just um, interesting for us to see what will happen in the future. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Tolsten uh, Rapp. Uh, as I said that I visited the RAN Biosphere 10 years ago, I was really impressed uh, by uh, different uh, activities uh, for sustainable development. And I believe that uh, uh, German Greenbelt is uh, really important as a good ecological corridor for the conservation of biological diversity. Thank you. Um, then I forgot, uh, Ms. Lia Jakia had, has some problem of internet connection. So she is not available for uh, questions or comments. Okay, since uh, we don't have any uh, questions and uh, comments, I would like to uh, ask a question by myself again. Uh, this time, it will be directed to uh, Professor Yu uh, at the Jeju National University. Uh, you said that uh, uh, the women divers, or in Korean, Henya, of Jeju has a special culture and the special culture uh, has a role uh, in solving social conflicts and also uh, it's very helpful uh, in using the uh, extracting the natural resources sustainably. Uh, but I think uh, time is uh, flying and uh, uh, the economic situation is changing very fast. And uh, I think uh, these days, the women divers are competing with uh, commercial fishing. So uh, many dec decades ago, uh, the Henner culture was enough to uh, conserve the biological diversity in the marine areas of Jeju, but now, uh, when they are competing with the commercial fishing, they cannot win. So my question is, um, uh, what will be the future of uh, Henya uh, culture and uh, the fate of uh, uh, Henya activities in modern societies? And what will be the role of uh, Henya uh, in uh, sustainable use and uh, conservation of uh, uh, natural resources in Jeju. Uh, Professor Yu, please. Uh, thank you for your question. And the uh, future of uh, Henya in modern society uh, in nowadays is a very big question. But I try to answer uh, such a big question. First of all, Henya do not compete with commercial scuba diving fisheries because fisheries law in Korea designates the area where Henya catch seafood and the area of commercial scuba diving fisheries respectively by the depths of the sea. The challenge in Henya fisheries comes from the fact that the number of henya is decreasing and the henya are aging because uh, there have been very few new recruits to the henya profession since the mid 1970s. Nowadays, the Jeju henya are working until they are over 80 years of age. So in, in 2019, the age group, uh, the largest age group of Jeju Henya was over 70 years of age group. But fortunately, after uh, the Jeju Henya culture was inscribed on the UNESCO's representative list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity in 2016, there were six Henya in 20s as of December 2019. So the new young Henya is uh, uh, some results of the inscriptions of UNESCO. 
And uh, for the future of Hainan fisheries, the various measures to safeguard and to revitalize Hainan culture and Hainan fisheries should be developed with the active participation and cooperation of the Hainan themselves. For example, the revitalization of Jeju Hainan culture must emphasize much more the cooperative nature of the diving work and consider learn more the value of common goods and care about new Hainan and elder Hainan. So I, I think that <laughs> that's the all. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yu. Um, now, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, any questions from the floors. Okay, I think we have only a few minutes left allowed to us. Before closing, I have uh, one advertisement. The uh, MAP National Committee of uh, the Republic of Korea and the Korean National Commission for UNESCO published a small booklet, which is called Biosphere Reserves and Peace. So this uh, booklet is available on the webpage of UNESCO MAP. Please visit uh, the webpage of the UNESCO MAP. You can download uh, this booklet. Now, uh, it's time to close. Uh, thank you very much for uh, excellent presentations and your active participation from the floor. Please uh, uh, enjoy your evening or morning, depending where you are. Thank you very much again. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.